I was drawn to elephants at Makalali because I was actually scared of elephants. I came from another reserve where I had had a few negative or, or less than friendly experiences. And when I came here, I saw that the elephants were so completely different and the interactions were a lot more gentle and um, welcoming and it just drew me in and I started getting fascinated by how all the different role players in the herd worked and how the relationships between the calves and the mothers um, happened and I started getting to know the elephants and sp as I spent more time with them. Oh, so awesome when they come into the open, it's really, really nice. Yeah. So this is Holy Ears group and um, you can see where the natural food. Hello, hello. hello girls. Hello. There's Holy Ear. Oh, she's broken a huge chunk of her tusk off. Wow. She's standing in the road talking to them. There's number two. That's Tony. She's the second in charge, number two. Hello, big girl. So, where we are at the moment, particularly in South Africa, is that elephants have been pushed into smaller fragments of their former home ranges and um, coupled to that we put fences around them and so they're limited in terms of migration patterns etc. So we've created a whole bunch of tiny little populations in this former range and what we see happening within these small populations is that we have these very high um, growth rates and so what happens is that the resources potentially um, dry up in the long term and so the land is no longer able to sustain the elephants. So in terms of management and looking forward, um, it is necessary to, to manage the population and its growth in some way to forestall this from happening. Um, because clearly you want to protect biodiversity, you want to protect the elephants, you want to protect the, the system, the protected area, and um, without this management intervention, you know, you could, you could end up with some problems. So traditional means of population control specifically for elephants have included translocation and culling. Now translocation is the process whereby groups of elephants, um, family groups of elephants are actually physically moved to a new location where they are rehomed um, and also individual bulls also moved and um, this has proved very very positive and very um, workable um, and in fact it's how most of the, the small private game reserves in South Africa actually got their elephant populations. Mm -hmm. Excess elephants were moved out of Kruger, translocated out of Kruger um, to populate these new reserves. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately though what's happened is there are very few areas left to move elephants to and so the and the very areas to which they were moved are now sitting with their own overpopulation problems. Mm. And so the scope for translocation has um, shrunk and it's, it's, it's really not a workable solution in, anymore. I think there's still scope for um, moving individuals in terms of uh, preserving genetic diversity in populations, but in terms of establishing new populations, it's very limited. Mm. Um, culling was another method that was used, um, predominantly within our national parks and this is the process whereby uh, entire family groups were actually destroyed initially by lethal injection and later by, um, by, by gunshots um, and what this does is it, it actually destroys the entire family unit and previously they actually used to cull a selective percentage of the population and the little orphans that were left were actually then taken and translocated to form um, new populations. But what we've learned over the years is that this has resulted in very severe behavioural consequences as these orphan elephants grow up in new situations without adult intervention, without adult supervision, and they become what we call almost like juvenile delinquents. And they manifest very negative behaviour and in, in the case of um, young bulls, it's often displayed through aggression towards other species, specifically rhinos. Um, and the only way to which you can curb that behaviour is actually introducing big bulls, adult bulls, into those populations to teach the younger bulls mm -hmm. the manners and the way of the elephants, mm -hmm. and those behaviours stop. Um, clearly, once 
we had found out about these repercussions of moving um, orphan elephants, the procedure has largely been stopped. And so now when units are culled, the entire unit is culled. Um, there has been a recent um, debate, a very public debate within South Africa with regards to culling and its scope. And it has been met with a lot more opposition. People do view it as um, unethical and and from a scientific perspective, together with translocation, those are the only two methods that will immediately reduce an overpopulated population. There is nothing else that will immediately reduce the numbers. Um, however, we are working on a new methodology for elephants, that is, and that is immunocontraception. And immunocontraception is another form of population growth control. And what it actually does is it it controls the reproductive rates of female elephants in the herd. And the beauty of it is that it is reversible, it is humane, it is cost effective, and it is easily implemented to free-ranging animals in the field. And what it does is it simply prevents the female elephant that's been vaccinated from conceiving. So in effect, what we're doing is we are lengthening the intercalving intervals, in other words, the birth of one calf to another, within specific individuals or within a certain population, percentage of the population that you're treating. Um, it's a long-term management objective, it's a responsible form of management as it forecasts um, your population into the future and allows you to, to control growth in that sense. As I mentioned, it is reversible, so if you stop administering the vaccine, the females can once again conceive and um, they can produce young. And this is important because in systems we never know what's going to happen. Ecosystems are about flux. If a disease had to come into the population and wipe it out, clearly you would want to be able to render that the population could sustain itself and to, and, and to grow. And with this methodology, this, that is capable of happening. So there's two babies, which is very exciting because that means that that was the collar's baby, that's Cheeky's baby, and she's a reversible, she's a reversal cow. So, which means she's reversed off the program. This is waves. That's squirt. Now squirt is the first time mommy that's her first baby. We know that elephants are extremely social animals and they are very, very long lived animals. And with any management intervention one has to be very careful of the the repercussions and the implications of those management interventions. So one of our major focuses here at Makaloli has been quite a comprehensive and long-term behavioural study with regards to the contraceptive program. And because this methodology is non-hormonal and non-steroidal, we have not seen any untoward uh, behaviours cropping up as has been witnessed in previous contraception studies with elephants where hormonal implants were actually utilized. Um, and so for the, for the 11 years that the program has been running at Makalali, we have witnessed absolutely no abhorrent social behavior. Our herd fission and fusion remains the same. Um, herd associations remain intact. Matriarchs do not lose matriarchal status um, have, with, with no production of carbs. And we have also seen that there's been no um, increased interaction or harassment by bulls tagging along with the cows and spending more time with them. And this is really important because the main behaviors associated with reproduction, so mate selection and mating, and within the bulls, dominance related to must, etc. All those behaviors have remained intact and as they should be as displayed in untreated populations. When the, the trials for immunocontraception were initiated, they were run back to back with hormonal contraception trials. And the hormonal trials actually yielded, yielded some very severe 
and untoward behavioural anomalies. So we actually saw a lot of um, uncharacteristic elephant behaviour. So we had bulls separating cows from their herds. Um, we had calves at foot actually dying because the bulls wouldn't allow them to suckle from their mothers. We had cows that were separated from their herds for indefinite periods of time. And all of these are not normal elephant behaviours. And so as a result of that, the hormonal trials were actually stopped. It received a lot of press coverage and unfortunately, there's still a lot of confusion regarding the two methodologies. Um, the public are not aware that there, there are these two differences between the hormonal contraception and the immunocontraception. And so to this day, we still have quite a job of educating people to say that our methodology is completely different, is non-hormonal and non-steroidal, and um, we have no social um, abhorrent behaviour as was displayed with the hormonal trials. A lot of damage was done there because it did blanket contraception and so people lump the two into the same bucket. So in spending all this time in Makalali with the Ellies, I've been here for just over 10 years now, almost 13 in fact, um, I've been very privileged to spend a lot of time with them, a lot of intimate time with them. And as an ecologist slash scientist, I've been trained to record things and try to remain scientific and very unbiased. But the more time I spend with elephants, the harder it becomes to do that. Because in spending time with them, I see their sense of humor. I see their grief when they lose their babies. I feel their joy when they connect with family members or with different bond groups at a water hole if they haven't been together for a couple of days. I feel their anxiety when there's storms brewing. And there is no other way to conceptualize it other than to put it in terminology and emotions that we express and that we feel. So at the risk of sounding anthropomorphic, which I know I am, there is no other way to describe it. I take solace from the fact that Cynthia Moss and Joyce Poole have described elephant behaviours, and amongst their descriptions, they've actually got classifications for behaviours such as play, and begging, and aggression, and soliciting play, and those sorts of behaviours. Very things that we see in our own children, and in our own kind. And um, it's very difficult to not spend time with elephants and see a part of ourselves in them. So we at Makalali are very fortunate that we've partnered up and formed a collaboration with the Humane Society International. And together we are forging a way of changing the way in which elephants are managed and that even in some small segment, we know that we've already made a change, that we've already changed the lives within our own population and within the 12 other reserves that have actually adopted this methodology as their management strategy. And so we, we, are, we can rest with the fact that we know that we've spared elephants in those populations. So our motto and our goal now is to take it into bigger reserves and bigger parts and, and and to, to promote this alternative method of humane and ethical elephant management. I think it's just important that we realize that these, you know, some people refer to them as sentient beings. Um, but when we're talking about these mass management interventions, we need to do humanely and ethically you know, we need to move forward from, from old school thinking and just do what's always been done. And so if there are viable and alternative practices that are available to us, that's what we should be using. And so we shouldn't just blindly follow what's been forecast and what's been done in the past. We need to look forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.